Good Monday morning of the second week in Ordinary Time. Actually, it's 4.30 in the morning here, <laughs> something like that. I just got up early this morning, so I started to look at it. I do this on Thursday and Fridays, weeks before, a week before. I just don't want to get behind and then have to rush it. So this way I can take my time, actually. And it's interesting gospel. Mark is the, uh, gets right to the point. He's the proto-martyr, a uh, proto-writer or gospel writer. He's the first. And everyone's built on it, at least Matthew and Luke are based on Mark. I told you that before. Anyway, there's a great line in this. And it's a struggle between um, the old order and the new. You see, the early temptation of the church had to be, are we Jews or are we Christians? And Mark is writing to Jewish Christians in Rome. And I think the struggle there was to incorporate the Pharisaic traditions, the, the Old Testament, into the new, defining the new as opposed to the other way around. Uh, in other words, there, I mentioned this before, there was an assumption in the very early going of the church that you first had to be a Jew before you could become a Christian, and they had a break with that. And that's especially St. Paul's writings. And especially St. Paul. You could, be, you, you could be and you are a Christian without being a Jew. You see, and it's in, in a text that's, um, in, the, in the New Testament, you see that it's implicit in the discussions going on. I, I'll show it to you here, okay? I'll read it to you, the little section from Mark, okay? It's chapter two, he said, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees were accustomed to fasting, the Old Testament now, okay? People came to Jesus and objected. Why do the disciples of John Remember, John's the last of the old and the beginning of the new. But he is, a, he is a prophet in the tradition of the old, okay? Why do the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they, are, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from him. And then they will fast on that day. Right? Christ, of course, the bridegroom. Now here's the kicker lines. I think this was intended by Mark. No one sews a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old cloak. If he does, it full, its fullness pulls away, and the new from the old, and the tear gets worse. I have no idea about clothing on that, but that's what he's saying. But here, he says, likewise, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the skins are ruined. Rather, new wine is poured into fresh wineskins. I don't know anything about wineskins either. But I take as the point is you can't go backwards. We're not going back. We're not going to take the New Testament and put it into the Old Testament. Rather, we'll take the Old Testament and put it into the New and that's how it works. Yeah, that's how it works. You want to understand Moses' relationship to Christ, you start with Christ and then look at Moses. It doesn't take away from Moses, but it doesn't make Christ interpretable only through, Mo or through Moses. You want to understand Christ, you start with Christ, you see. And then, and the preaching of the church, then you read the Old Testament in light of it. That's how it works. It's not a proof text. The Old Testament proven by the New or is the proof of the New or something like that. It's not. Do you want to understand the Old Testament from a Christian perspective? You start with Christ. You start with Christ. And so you start with the New Testament. And in the light of the New Testament, you read the Old Testament, not the other way around. So that's important. It's important. But I think it's also true of life. If the old doesn't validate the new, the new in some ways validates the old. Uh, you can't go backwards. You can learn from the past, and we should learn from the past, but we interpret the past in the light of the presence and the present moment. And, as, and in our anticipation of the future, there are no good old days. I remember one time in the monastery, so that's, a te that's one of the problems. Well, monastic, let me tell you, it was right during the Vatican Council, just right after, and it was a very difficult time. 
uh, in the order because the old order of things, the way we did things was under question now, it was unquestioned when I joined the outfit. The question was, was I tough enough to live the life? Not what was it worth living, but was I tough enough to live it? That was a very different question because the council threw into question the entire narrative, as it were, of the praxis, the practice of the church in so many ways became scrutinized. So did the traditions in the order. And we went from the question, am I strong enough, tough enough, focused enough, disciplined enough, virtuous enough to live this life, to why should I live it? Or what makes it valid? Once you question the narrative, to quote Aristotle, Humpty Dumpty comes off the wall. And it's exactly what happened. The narrative, once we began to question the narrative, you, so many became doubtful. The men in the outfit, from priests to students, our brothers. And people left, they defected. But not only did they leave, I told you that before, not only did they leave, because it wasn't their vocation. They left because in many ways, in many, many ways, they lost their faith. I remember, I remember asking, I told you this before, asking myself, do I believe in Christ? Not do I, am I called to the priesthood? Is the priesthood wonderful? Is it something I'm called to serve? The first question I had to answer, and the one that was not, do I believe in who and what is Christ? Because if I doubt that, the priesthood's meaningless. You see, it was that radical and that fundamental. And I also learned something that as much as I love the old order of the church, the old order, it's where I grew up in the faith, but also the old customs and order of my, my community, the Passionists. I was drawn into the Passionists. I was attracted to the Passionists powerfully, overwhelmingly, by her monasticism, not her apostolic life, but her monasticism. And yet, for the last 52 years, I have lived the passionist life in solitary mode, not in a community. Even when I lived in Louisville, I was essentially living on my own. I wasn't under the system in the strict sense. I participated fully, but I wasn't under it. I was under the Eastern province, not the Western. It made a difference. I have been, in a sense, on my own since 1971, 52, 53 years now, 52 years. Okay? And yet what drew me into the order was precisely its monasticism. And it was precisely the monasticism that, in a sense, ended in its full form, in its full form, ended with the Vatican Council, Second Vatican. We, you could not describe our passionist way of life as fully monastic. This was. It was a combination of full monasticism and apostolic life. And it's just not anymore. The church said there is no such thing. You're either monastic or you're apostolic, which you're not. There's not that combination. And it's the de facto what happened. So while there are some monastic practices still present in our communities, it isn't the full-blown monasticism that when I joined it in 1971, 1961, okay? tempo cambia, the times change. We are not called into the past, we're called into the future. And that's what you get here in our Lord's saying. The Pharisees, we're not imitating the Pharisees. We are not looking to the past, but to tomorrow, to the future. And the future is in the person of Christ. And he doesn't call us to, to replicate the past, but to invent the future with him, with the bridegroom. See? We're not here to make yesterday today, but to make today the grounds of tomorrow. We look to tomorrow. Yeah. We draw from the past. We revere the past. We draw from it, as we do in our families. But we don't go backwards. I can't relive the life I lived with my parents. But I honor them, and I remember them, and I love them, and I try to live according to them, in a sense, but my way. The only thing my father said, never dishonor us. That's simple. Never dishonor. Don't make a damn fool out of yourself. But do it your way. 
think of Frank Sinatra my way, but it's an honorable way, a faithful way, but my way.